The time was between about 7.40 and 7.20, and during that time, a number of things were happening. A very important, strong Assyrian ruler by the name of Tiglath Pileser III had made his, we, all, we always refer to him in school as TP3, um, <laughs> but he was making his way into the country and he took places like Geshur in the north and eventually making, making his way towards Samaria. Um, between him and Ashurbanipal and later Sennacherib, these three uh, come in waves and basically uh, sack the northern kingdom and wipe out 46 Judean cities. During the time when that is rising, from everywhere from about 750 onward, there's almost the hoof beats of the coming of a war in the background of the book. And so uh, Isaiah, Micah, and Hosea will all be part of a triad of writers during this time and prophets during this time. His name, Micha, Micha is like, um, it's literally who is like you. That's what it is. Um, and it's it, it, sometimes Michayahu or Michaya in the Bible. It's the same name, who is like, but it, who is like Yahweh, who is like God. Um, Micha is a, an interesting prophet because he gives us probably the earliest complete messianic picture. The two prophets that are going to give you very good looks at Messiah that come from the divided kingdom period include Isaiah, who will give you a very good description of what Messiah will come and be like, and Micha, or Micah. And really, there are four rounds of judgment. These are four <laughs> oracles, four testimonials of coming judgment, but at the end of each one, there's a Messiah statement. So remember in Ecclesiastes, I showed you there was like what was going on and then a, a response, a God response. It, this is set up in that same way. So for instance, I'm going to do this like it's a four round fight, okay? Round one is essentially 1-1 one, one to 2-13. And it's the first of the oracles but what's interesting in it is that when you look very closely at 2.12 and 2.13, these are actually messianic statements. Messiah statement number one is in 2.12 and 2.13. It's part of the oracle, but it's specifically concerning the description of Messiah. That should tell you that as a study, do you remember how you asked me to email to you the conclusions of Ecclesiastes. The study, if you want to know about Messiah, you can see the Oracle 1. You can see each of the Oracles of Judgment, but if you want to know God's solution in Messiah, you're going to need to look at the other part of the, um, the actual stories. So let's look at two things. We actually want our eyes to see two different things. So we're going to look across and see not only the oracle, but also the messianic statement. Does that make sense? So there's essentially two sets of messages here. There's the, the message concerning why God is judging, and in specific, as this incredible army is approaching and the hoofbeats are beating in the background, you ought to have a sense that something's going on. So the judgment that comes has to be explained. But there's also that messianic claim that is made four different times that gives you a little bit of hope in the background of the book. By the way, at the beginning of Micah in your Bible, I would write down Jeremiah 26, 18. Jeremiah 26, 18. Because beyond Micah 1.1, 1, 1, we don't know a lot about him except from, for the fact that he's from Moreshet, which is probably Moreshet Gath. It's probably um, in Judah. And that Jeremiah 26.18 gives you just a little bit more background on him. That's all we really have. So what I want you to see is 734 to 32, Tiglath Pileser comes and there's a wave uh, coming at them. And, and you can see that in 2 Kings 15. When we get a little further in 2 Kings, you'll see this wave occur. But then again, there's another wave in 722-21 in which the northern kingdom falls. And finally in 701, a third wave when Sennacherib comes to take Jerusalem but doesn't get it and leaves behind 
uh, archaeologically Sennacherib's prism, which is a big prism that says, I, uh, concerning Jerusalem, I locked them up like a bird in a cage, which meant I didn't take them. It was a way of telling the hometown folks I didn't win that war. It was a nice way to say it. Like, I really laid siege against them. Of course, I didn't win, but that's beside the point. And so we'll be looking at some of those stories. Let's go down to chapter one and take a quick look at some of the judgment. And let me say that 1 1 to 2 11, for me, the upper box here, uh, up until you get to the first messianic statement, I would simply put the words, the need to judge. Why judge? Why is God going to judge his people? And there's an introduction with the judgment of Samaria and Jerusalem. Listen to this. The word of the Lord came to Michal of Marashat in the days of Yotam, Achatz, Hezekiah, uh, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, O peoples, all of you. Listen, O earth, and all it contains. And let the Lord God be a witness against you the Lord from his holy temple. So when you start off this, he starts off and he says it in a poetic way, but is, it, is there any doubt that Micha is claiming to give God's word? Does it sound at all like he's going, you know, I was just thinking. No, he comes out of the gate with, God is a witness against you and he's doing it from his holy temple. In other words, and now God's word. And then he goes on and says, Behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him. The valleys will be split like wax before the fire, like water poured down on a steep place. He says, God is going to come, and when he lands, he will leave a footprint. You will know he was here. There is something big and dramatic, and it's about to happen. And why is it going to happen? Circle in verse one, uh, 5, the word rebellion. Because of the rebellion of Jacob and the sins of the house of Israel. What is the rebellion of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So he starts off and he says, I'm going to do this for rebellion, but he defines the rebellion as idolatry. Circle the word high place in verse 5. In other words, because of the false worship, rebellion in the form of religious worship that doesn't represent a real relationship with me. And then he goes on and he says, For I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the open country, planting places for a vineyard. He says, I'm going to take the organized city that was built up at Samaria during the divided kingdom, this nice, organized, powerful city, and I'm going to scatter its stones and turn it into a natural vineyard. You're about to get stomped. And by the way, within a few years, that's exactly what would happen. It would be turned back into fallow ground as the people would be carted away in Assyria. So he says, he says, um, I will pour her stones into the valley. I will lay bare her foundations. All of her idols will be smashed. You can underline all of her idols and relate it back to her rebellion, which is her false religion, which is her idolatry. All her earrings will be burned with, uh, uh, I'm sorry, all her earnings will be burned with, with fire and all her uh, images will be made desolate. And she, and for she collected them from the harlot's earnings, and to the earnings of a harlot, they will return. Now he makes a reference that should make you think of Hosea, a contemporary prophet. Now here, he's doing something. He's talking about the Jewish people, and he's saying that um, you have collected up in temple. Remember, temple equals bank in the ancient period. You've collected up in your temples essentially the earnings that come from, uh, from whoredom as far as idolatry is concerned. Now he goes on and he says, um, because of this, I, will, I must lament and wail. I must go barefoot and naked. I must make a lament like the jackals and a mourning like the ostriches. I don't know if you know this. Some of you, I don't, I'm not sure where we're going to stay when we're in the Galilee, but there are a number of ostrich farms near the Sea of Galilee. Um, ostriches can make a horrendous sound. Uh, peacocks and ostriches are the two that you just don't want to be around when they're not happy. 
And so he, he uses this term. Now, here's what he says. In verses 1 to 7, he says, look, I just need to introduce you that Samaria and Jerusalem are about to undergo judgment. And I want you to understand that I'm going to lament the coming of this wrath. Because what happens to godly people is that they're also affected by the nation's sin. This is a prophet who gets up and says, you don't understand. Your sin is going to ruin my children's lives. And, and, and right now, you should be able to understand that concept. For her wound is incurable. It has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. He says, it may have started in the north, this idolatry, but it's reached Jerusalem and it's corrupted even the most important places where God is being worshipped. He says, tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. At Beit Le Afra, he's, he's using a very diff, uh, specific, um, Beit is house. Le Afra, the, to dust, the house to dust. At the place of the house of dust, roll yourself in the dust. He's saying, go to the place where, we, where you get the ashes to put on your body for sackcloth and ashes, roll in it. Go on your way, inhabitants of, of Shafir, which is the word for beauty. It's a, it's a, um, a place for... Um, I want you to go to this place of beauty and I want you to grab onto shameful nakedness. The, inhabitant, the inhabitants of Za'anan, or Za'anan is a, a city in Judah, does not escape. The lamentation of Beit Ezel, and here he's using a, a name, another name from uh, uh, a place from uh, Judah. He says, the lamentation of Beit Azel will take you from its support. Okay, here's what I'm trying to say. It started in Samaria, and it was okay when it was up there, but now it reached Jerusalem. And now it's actually corrupted the inside of the worship center. And all of us are going to lament because all of us are going to play a, pay a price. He says, for the inhabitants of Marot become weak, waiting for good. Look at that phrase in verse 12. He says that there are godly people that are going to lament because their world is going to go south because, because of the way uh, uh, pagan people and people without a right heart for God have taken over the system. But then he goes on and he says, there's a lot of people that are growing weaker and weaker and weaker, waiting for good because a calamity has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. He says, listen, when people don't walk with God, when the, when the bastions of our faith are shaken by all kinds of erosion in what they're teaching, then people who have a heart for God start getting weaker. And that weakening literally robs the church of its vitality, or in this case, the Jewish people of their vitality. Harness the chariot to, uh, to the team of horses, O inhabitants of Lachish. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, because in you were found the rebellious acts of Israel. Therefore, you will give parting gifts on behalf of Mereshet Gath. The houses of Akzib will become a deception to the kings of Israel. He's talking about different cities and villages and how they participated in this rising paganism. If we knew them, if we knew these communities, we could even talk about different um, let's say, church communities where we started to see deception rising. It's the kind of sense that he's giving to it. Then he says this, Moreover, I will bring on you the one who takes possession, O inhabitant of Moresha. The glory of Israel will enter Adullam. Do you remember where Adullam showed up in our text before? Adullam is actually a Canaanite word. It's from a Canaanite city. But uh, do you remember then the cave of Adullam was one of the places that David hid? He's, he says, make yourself bald, cut off your hair because of the children of your delight. Extend your baldness like that of the eagle, for they will go from you into exile. He says, I want you to understand that there's coming a time when you will be stripped and humbled and led away. And I want you to get ready because it's about to happen in your life. Now, one of the things he goes on to say is in the beginning of chapter 2, I want you to see three charges and their penalties and see why it is I'm going to do this. And the first one he mentions is, in fact, greed. Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they, they do it. 
for it is in the power of their hands. These are people who are planning or plotting. And what are they plotting? Look at verse 2. They covet fields and seize them. These are people who, because of their greed, are plotting ways to take the land out of the hands of other people to acquire their goods. We would call that an economy, right? The whole idea of getting the money out of your pocket and putting it in mine. These are people who are working extra hours in the wee hours of the morning, plotting and scheming to figure out how to get your stuff out of your hands. And, and they covet fields, they seize them, houses, and they take them away. They rob a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. They have no sense of shame about stealing what's yours. This is the person who's crafting and plotting identity theft. They're going to steal your stuff. This is the person who's planning that virus so they can get on your computer, so they can control and get your stuff and steal your bank account. These are people who are deliberately out of greed, stealing. And he goes on and he says, it's not only greed, it's also theft. And it's not only theft, but keep going. Therefore, says the Lord, I am planning against this family a calamity from which you cannot remove your necks, and you will not walk haughtily, for it will be an evil time. On that day, they will take up against you a taunt and, and utter a bitter lamentation and say, we are completely destroyed. He exchanges the portion of my people, how he removes it from me to the apostate he apportions our fields. He says, what's coming on you is a judgment where someone's going to come in and you've been taking from each other and now I'm going to send a big power to come in and take it all away from you. And you're all going to go, we don't have anything to defend us. You did it to each other and now I'm going to let it happen for from the outside. And then he says, therefore, verse 5, you will have no one stretching a measuring line for you by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Do not speak out, so they speak out. But if they do not speak out concerning these things, reproaches will not be turned back. He says, there's, a, there's a, another thing I want to say about what's going to happen. There's going to be a compromise of truth. There's going to be, in verse 6, he says, do not speak out, so they speak out. But if they do not speak out concerning these, these things, reproaches will not be turned back. He's saying, I want you to understand there's coming a time when you won't be able to be trusting what you're hearing, even from your leaders. You can't imagine that happening, can you? A time when people who lead you will tell you things that aren't true, deliberately. They will actually falsify what you know. How, how can, what's that? So this would be the third charge. I would say the third charge here is uh, a compromise of truth or open lying or hiding. Now, now, here's the thing. You get all the way down and he says, is it being said, O house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to the one who walks uprightly? Recently, my people have arisen as an enemy. You strip the robe off the garment from unsuspecting passers-by, from those returned from war. The women of my people you evict, each one from her pleasant house, and her children you take from her children you take my splendor forever. Arise and go for this. There is no place of rest because of the uncleanness that brings on destruction, a painful destruction. He sort of, he summarizes and he says, you are taking advantage of people. You can't be trusted. You hurt people. You steal their stuff. And you're going to wonder why judgment is coming. Remember, this whole first oracle is judgment, judgment. It's coming. You're going to lose city after city after city. They're, your children are going to be taken away. And it's because of the way you're behaving. The moral and ethical compromises are leading them to judgment and the prophet says, I need to give you an explanation of the reason why it's leading you to judgment. Now, one of the things you have to understand is that this particular um, piece of literature gives you something that's very, very tough to understand when you read it on the surface. I want you to drop your eyes down to verse 11 and 12 and 13. In 11, he wraps up his indictment. He says, if a man walking after, the, after wind and falsehood had told lies and said, I will speak out to you concerning this wine and liquor, he would be a spokesman to this people. He said, if a guy gets up and sells you snake oil, you guys will make him a celebrity. You don't even understand truth anymore. You don't even know how to evaluate whether what you're being told is true anymore. You've totally lost track 
of the moral compass I gave you. That's what he's saying. Now, when you get to 12 and 13, there's a relief coming. Because right about now, you ought to feel like I've been beating on you. You ought to be feeling like, oh, there's greed. Oh, there's, there's theft. Oh, there's corruption. Oh, there's lying. And you feel kind of bad. And then he says, I want to offer you a glimpse of hope. The problem with this glimpse of hope is it's not easy to see. You're going to have to be able to go a little bit wider when you see it. Okay. Verses 12 and 13. I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. That is all the Jewish people. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. That is those who are torn away out of Israel. I will put together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. He said there's coming a time when you're going to be judged, but there's also coming a time when Messiah will gather all of you together. This is a messianic claim that God is going to pull together and that, that although they had been scattered, they'll be noisy in the pen, meaning there's you know, lots of them stuffed in the pen, stuffed close together. Now, here's where it gets very difficult. There's a word in verse 13 that I need you to circle. Verse 13, the breaker goes up before them. They break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. So their king goes before them and the Lord at their head. The last part of the verse, so the king goes before them and the Lord at their head, is a Hebrew couplet. In a couplet, the second half equals the first half. In other words, he says the king goes before them and the king is also the Lord at their head. They're the same. One equals the other in the couplet. Okay? This is a comparative couplet. Sometimes you have a, uh, a contrastive couplet where the first half says the opposite of the second half, but it means the same thing like um, everybody went and the second half of the couplet and no one was left behind. It means the same thing, but it's, the, it's two contrasting views of the same thing. Okay? Here's what I want you to see. Circle the word breaker because the word breaker is the word poretz. This is an important concept. And when you look at the word poretz, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. Poretz means uh, when you want to get uh, sheep out of a pen, how do you do it? Well, all you really need to do is kick a part of the wall down. The first one will go through, and then they'll start going through, and they'll push the wall down as they go. The first one's the breach maker. The second one comes through after. Okay? I, what I want you to understand is this is a title. This is a messianic passage. And in the New Testament, they use a style of teaching that is called remez. Remez is the Hebrew word for hint. What my wife says I do not take well. A hint, meaning... A remez is when you go in later on and mention a portion of a known portion to recall an idea. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say Ellie's over here and Tiffany and Ellie have to share a piece of paper because somebody didn't bring paper and Ellie is taking all the paper and she won't give Tiffany any of the paper because you know her and you know what she's like. And so I turn to her and I say it unto her, it's like God so loved the world. It's God so loved the world that he did what? So what am I saying to do? Give, give her the paper. Now, I didn't say give her the paper, and if you don't know the quote, what I said didn't have anything to do with what was happening. That's a remez. You read in the New Testament a quote from the old that doesn't seem to have anything to do with what's going on. Jesus and Paul both do it extensively. It will drive you crazy. But you have to know two things in order to understand what they're saying. You have to know the passage, and you have to know how the passage was cut in the Hebrew Scriptures. So, for instance, if I quote from Genesis, and I'm the Apostle Paul, and I quote from Genesis, okay? How was Genesis originally divided? You know this. It was originally divided how? 
Originally a prologue, 1, 1 to 2, 3, and then 10 Toledot. This is the account of scrolls. This is the story of. This is the story of. So when I quote a portion of a portion, it represents that whole scroll. I may give you a portion from verse 3, but the part, point that I'm making is in verse 27. Now, how is it you would know that? Because you all went to school. You didn't take books home from school. How did you learn? You memorized, and that's how everybody knew it. So I could start a sentence, for God so loved the world, and everybody here can finish it. Why? Because you memorized it. But in the biblical world, they memorized whole tracts of scripture. And the reason that Jesus uses Deuteronomy more often than any other place is it's the first thing you learned. So I can say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the And I know that you're going to know it's to the democracy, to the state. Now you're going to know what it is, OK? Biblically speaking, this is what they learned. They had one scroll in town of Genesis at the synagogue. How'd you do your homework? You memorized it. That's how you got. So they did teacher, 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 student, 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 teacher, 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 student, student, student. And they went back and forth in drill and skill until they went home and could do their homework based on their memory. Now, because of that, Expect a remez to show up in the New Testament because everybody went to the same Sabbath schools. The same synagogues were training them all. Go to Matthew chapter 11, turn in your Bible there, and when you get to Matthew 11, you're in a passage that relates to Messiah because it's in the New Testament, but specifically it relates to the forerunner of Messiah, John the Baptizer. And I want you to notice that when it says um, this is Jesus talking about John, this is Messiah talking about the forerunner who came before him, his cousin John. And he says in verse 11 of chapter 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of woman, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is at least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What does that mean? It means he had the privileged position of announcing Messiah, which made him unique in all the earth. Like Joseph was the first one to call Jesus salvation. John was the first one to publicly proclaim, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. But the problem is he is already going to be locked up and killed before the king shows all his cards. So you know more than John ever knew about the deity and position of Jesus Christ. You in the kingdom know more than John did because he died before he got to see it. In other words, he was greatest among his fellows, but he's least when it comes to people later who will know things he can't know. Okay? Now follow the line, verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent men take it by force. Well, it's, it, it might look like he's saying, you know, that they're locking him up in prison, and, you know, they're all, you know, the politics, politicians are all against us. But actually what it says is this. All the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who has come. I want you to see that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence is a, is a Greek rendered version, I believe, of this, of breaching or breaking. It seems to me, and by the way, in the, in the uh, Hebrew version of the passage in the New Testament, it's a little clearer, but it seems to me what he's saying is, there was already an opportunity for you to know about this. There was a breach maker coming from the king, from the time the breach maker brought the breach until now the kingdom was proclaimed. The problem is if you take any New Testament scholar, they will give you 10, verse, 10 uh, lines to try and explain this verse because it's so hard to translate. You know what I think the problem is? I think what he was doing was causing, calling a remez of something from before. I think next to ch verse 12, I would write um, Micah chapter 2, verse 13. 
because I think Micah 213 is the breach maker. The violence he's talking about is that the kingdom suffers violence. That's not how I would translate that at all. For, uh, at all. It's actually, the, it forces its way through breaches is actually what the Greek says. The kingdom forces its way through breaches. Here's what I think. I think that Micah promised that Messiah was going to come, but that one would go before him that would force the breach open, and then he would come through, and behind him many sheep would follow. I think Jesus is referring back to that, and I think the New Testament translator, unfamiliar with the Remaz, is struggling to find a way to translate the passage to make sense when it doesn't actually make any sense if you don't refer back to the original passage. The actual Greek translation into English of this passage is labored the way you're reading it. That's not the way you would translate that passage. Let's tune in and go back to Micah, and this time we're going to pick up the second oracle. And if the first oracle was, you know what, yeah, I need to judge you guys, because you guys have been pulling on some, uh, some greed and some theft and some compromise of truth and lying. Uh, I need to judge you. The second judgment, the second round two, which you'll find in 3.1 all the way to 4.8, is that the leaders will be held in special scrutiny. If, if God is going to judge... Let's say now, if God is going to judge his church, he's going to judge the leaders of that church more harshly and more severely. James says it this way, stop being so many teachers for theirs is the greater condemnation. If you don't want your life more carefully inspected by God, then don't be a leader. Because leaders take double shots. That's what happens. Look at verse, look at verse 1 of chapter 3. And I said, hear now, heads of Jacob, and rulers of the house of Israel, underline the word heads, rulers. He's talking about leadership here. Is it not for you to know justice? Is it not the job of the leader to know the difference between right and wrong? It's not, it's not all the followers I'm coming after. It's you guys who were supposed to know the difference. You who hate good and love evil. What a description that is. And then you see in verse 4, Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time, because they have practiced evil deeds. So it's interesting. It, you can see in verse 4 that they cry out to the Lord, but he doesn't answer. So one of the things that are going on is their standards are set aside. They become cruel, but also there's a distance from God. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. When they have something to, to bite with their teeth, they cry, Peace! But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. So they'll fight. At the first bite they get, they'll run around going, peace, peace, peace. But the first time, the first time that they look at some uh, situation that's not going to be of any benefit to them at all, they'll cry out war. And then he says, therefore, it will be night for you without vision, darkness for you without divination. That is God's direction. The sun will go down on the prophets and the day will become dark over them. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners will be embarrassed. Indeed, they will all cover their mouths because there is no answer from God. They'll seek God and they won't hear from him. It, you know, the Bible teaches that if you lay on yourself the wrong standard and follow after that wrong standard, you can cry out to God to try and get him to speak and he will withhold his voice. So... One of the things you should know is that when, you are, um, when you're not yielded to God, you'll still read your Bible, but it won't mean anything. You won't, be able to get, you won't be able to shake loose what he's talking about. So it says, on the other hand, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel his sin. So the prophet says, it's not that God isn't speaking. It's not that nobody has truth. It's that you don't. I'll tell you what he's saying. What he's saying is, you're all lying. That's what he's saying. Now, hear this. Heads of the house of Jacob. I underlined heads of the house of Jacob because, again, he's moved from uh, the rulers in verse 1 through 4 to the prophets in verses 5 through 8. Now back to the heads of the house of Jacob and rulers. It says, rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight. That's a great phrase. You take something simple and you twist it around. 
I don't know if you've ever actually spent any time reading law, but uh, there's a lot of the time when it, honestly, I knew a lot about it till I read, it, read the law. Then I almost couldn't figure out what it was that we were talking about. Do you know that you can overcomplicate things to the point where you could say what's untrue and nobody would know? I think we live in a day of such incredible blustery complexity that everything befuddles us even when it's simple. Even when it's as simple as this is right, this is wrong, we turn it into this convoluted, but there's so many details involved, and we overload and lose the simplicity of right and wrong. It's interesting, he says uh, that what's underlying it is that they abhor justice. They, they don't want justice. They want to twist things. Look at verse 11. Her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe. Her priests instruct for a price, and her prophets divine for money. That is, everybody's on the take. You're not going to believe this, but do you know what one of the problems of ancient Judah was? Their televangelists were in it for money. That's hard to believe, isn't it? People using religion to get rich? Oh my God. And that's exactly what he, he says. Come on. He said, is not the Lord in our midst? Calamity will not come upon us. This is people going, no, everything's going to be fine. We're just, we're just loving the Lord and he's just blessing us. They're fleecing people, he says. And he says, therefore, on account of you, Zion will be a plowed field. Jerusalem will be a heap of ruins. And the mountain of the temple will become a high, high places of a forest. You should know, by the way, that on the temple mount were always planted trees. He said, one day, the, that's all it'll be is just trees. Uh, even today, when you go up there, when you see that golden dome and the rock, all around it are trees. That platform was, was not fully covered, large gardens were left in it. Now, the bottom line here is, he says, listen, you leaders, you prophets, you speakers, you're all on the take. Now, what's the resolution? What do you do? Messianic claims. So 4, 1 through 8 gives you a breath of fresh air Messiah, okay? It will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of mountains. How do I know this is messianic? What changed in verse 1 from what we've been talking about all the way through chapter 3? There's no more judgment in the sentence. There's no more judgment in the sentence, and he tells you when it's going to happen. At the end, in the last days. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for for war. Notice the last days never again. Watch these words. This means at the very end of human history, at the last time, whatever that time is, we're going to, I'm going to jump, spoiler alert, millennium. I'm going to jump to the kingdom where the king is righteous in Jerusalem and all the nations are coming up and learning righteousness from him. That's, he's talking about a millennial kingdom. He's talking about a 1,000-year a kingdom where the Messiah sits on the throne and actually rules and nations come up and say, this other nation's doing this. And Jesus says, all right, this is the truth. This is right. You're wrong. You're right. You give him back this. Go home. And they will come and, and it says, each of them will sit under his own vine and under his fig tree. Verse 4, by the way, is typical Jewish prosperity. What it means is, you want to know what the dream of a Jewish person was in antiquity? To have my own vine and my own fig tree? In other words, I have my own way of getting what I need. I've got figs. I've got grapes. I've got my own little property here. I don't need much and no one to make them afraid. Would you underline in verse 4, and no one to make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken, though all the peoples walk each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. 
He says, when this happens, this is at the end of the Jewish people, and this is when they're all walking with him. Let me give you a hint. See Obadiah when Israel is holy. See, prophets are going to build on one another. There's coming a day in the future that the, there will be no more shame, Joel says, where the Jewish people will all be holy, where Romans 11 says all Israel will be saved, where Micah chapter 4 verses 1 through 8 say all the nations will come up to Israel and all of them will see that, that their God is sitting on the throne of, Jer of Jerusalem, on David's throne as it was promised, and he's going to cut between right and wrong. There's nothing metaphoric here. He's talking about a future for a people. Let's go to the second half of this book. Now, 4, 9 to 5, 5 gives us the judgment round three. Ding! Now, what's judgment round three? This is all about what happens when people allow falsehood to become the norm. When everybody thinks everybody's lying, but nobody's listening. Now, why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you? Has your counselor perished? That agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth. He says, listen, what's happening is you have lost your leadership defining voice because you guys won't even tell the truth. When, when people speak one way but live another, everybody knows that's what they're doing and there's no longer any reason to listen to them on that subject. So he says, writhe and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion, like a woman in childbirth, for now you will go out to the city, dwell in the field, you will go to Babylon. There it is. You're going to be taken away. This is, by the way, before Babylon is a thing. Babylon's a city, and it's an important one, but, but Nineveh's the problem right then. So he's jumped all the way out to Babylon, and he says, there you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Much, much later, they will go to Babylon, and from Babylon, they will be redeemed and brought back in. And God already made that clear. Here's what's interesting. You'll see, I would write next to verse 12, Habakkuk 1, 5 through 11. Habakkuk 1, 5 through 11. Listen to this, verse 11. And now many nations have been assembled against you who say, let her be polluted. Let her eyes gloat over Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord and they do not understand his purpose. He has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise, thresh, daughter of Zion. For your horn I will make iron and your hooves I will make bronze that you may pulverize many peoples, that you may devote to the Lord their unjust gain and their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. He says, I want you to know something. I want you to know that I'm going to call the nations together. Babylon and her friends are at the door. And I want you to respond and gather up the people because there's coming a time when I'm going to strengthen the Jewish people and they're going to tread down those who have tread down them. That's going to happen. Now, muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. God's calling in the nations. They have laid siege against us. With a rod, they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one, that is Messiah, will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. He says, I want you to... The nations are going to gather against you. I'm going to call them to gather against you. Oh, by the way, did I tell you that little town of Bethlehem? I'm going to raise up the one who is the eternal one. The one from the everlasting time. So Messiah comes into this in verses 2 through 5. Look at the messianic statement. What he says is, therefore he will give them up, verse 3, until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. He says, I'm going to bring Messiah. Then I'm going to bring and gather Israel subsequent to Messiah's coming. After Messiah is born. And by the way, there's huge gaps in time here. He just doesn't see them. 
after Messiah is born. Later than that, I will return the sons of Israel. And then verse 4, he will arise and shepherd his flock. This is the part he hasn't done yet. He's been born. The people of Israel will be gathered and he will shepherd in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be, he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. He's talking about Messiah. So he jumps all the way to the last day again. Now we're back at the last day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be born. I'm going to come to Bethlehem. I'm going to be the child, but that's not my beginning. I come from the days of everlasting, but I'm born here. But then he says, oops, jump to the last days. I'm going to gather my people and I'm going to be their king and I'm going to have majesty over them. And I don't think that Micah ever knew that he's like looking at this time, then he's looking at this time, then he's looking at this time, then he's looking at this time. I don't think he knows. I think he's saying what God told him to say. But the intricacy of the plan of God is written all over this. God's thumbprint is on this. Now, let's go and try to summarize. What do you see here? What's that upper box about? It seems to me that this is the loss of a voice. They have no voice. Why? Because they've become so unstable in what they're saying that their leadership has no proper and appropriate voice. God is going to call the nations, so he begins to build a war theme. He's going to call the nations to surround Israel. But then, down here, we've got, we've got woman, we've got birth, We've got king, might, we've got judge, all of this. He doesn't know there's a huge amount of time between those two. He has no idea. He just knows that Messiah is going to come, that he's going to be born in Bethlehem, that he's going to be born of a woman, but that's not his beginning. He was already from the ages before. Now, here's the thing. It's right there, but it's not. It's so clear, but it's not. Be a Jew and take the New Testament out. This isn't that easy to read, is it? Could, could you have gotten out of that what you know now because of the progressive revelation of the New Testament? No. It's in, have a little bit of sympathy for the Jewish person who's looking at this going, I, I don't get it. We're going to see this, by the way, in very complete terms. If you think this one's clear, wait till Isaiah where he pulls it out in 50 verses. Yeah and says, and then they strip him down, and then they beat him, and then they kill him, and then they deride him. I mean, he, he goes and he does a description that sounds like the day after Jesus, but it's not. In fact, if I give a Jewish friend of mine Isaiah 53 to read out loud, and I say to him, tell me what this is. What story, who do you think this is about? They'll say, well, yeah, this looks like it's about Jesus. I don't know anything about this, because they've never actually read it. It comes out of Isaiah. And when I tell them that, they feel like, no, nah, that's, that's not. I just gave you the Hebrew version of what Isaiah said, and you told me it was about Jesus. How did that happen? It's interesting because it's happened to me more than once. It's very, very startling how clear the prophets are if you know the story. Now, let's go to the last box. The, uh, the announcement of, of round four. He goes to a greater detail and he comes back and wants to revisit the sins of the people. And so he goes in 5-5, five, five, second half of 5. Notice that this one will be our peace, period, and then there's a space. Do you see it? So for some reason, they kept the same verse, but it's actually a different oracle. This is the fourth oracle, and it begins in the second half of verse 5. It says, when the Assyrian invades our land, when he tramples on our citadels, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight leaders of men. They will shepherd the land of, of Assyria with the, uh, they, uh, with the sword, the land of Nimrod at its entrances, the land, uh, and, the, and he will deliver us from Assyrians. And, and when he attacks our land, when he tramples our territory, then the remnant of Jacob, 
Jacob will be among many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on vegetation, uh, which do not wait for man or delay the sons of man. He says, listen, what's going to happen is the, the Assyrians are going to come down on us. We're going to end up getting scooped up by them and dumped in with lots of other people. And there's going to be lots of us. And there's going to be no way that we can stop it. And then it says in verse 8, the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations among many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest. It's interesting. Did you notice that? You put Jews together with everybody else and they rise to the top. They'll be like lions among beasts. They'll just rise to the top. How do I know? Well, look at the world economy. How do I know? Well, look at Hollywood. How do I know? Well, look at Wall Street. You don't see Jewish names all over the place? You're not looking. Like a young lion among the flocks of sheep. This is the rise of the Jewish people. That's what he's talking about. We're going to get scattered, but that doesn't mean you're not going to notice us. We're going to keep rising to the top like cream. And then it says, which if he passes through, tramples down and tears, and there is none to rescue. Your hand will be lifted up against your adversaries, and all your enemies will be cut out. Now, can you sort of feel that when he gets to verse 9, Eventually, God is going to bring your people victory. That's what verse 9 says. Eventually, God is going to bring your people victory. But then he says, the real victory will come in cleaning up the greed, the self-will, and the idolatry. It's not going to come financially. It's going to come spiritually. Look what he says. In that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and, your, and destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land. I will tear down your fortifications. I will cut off your sorceries, underline that one, from your hand, and you will have Fortune tellers, underline that one, no more. I will cut off your carved images, your sacred pillars from among you so that you will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. I will root out your asherim from among you and destroy your cities and I will execute vengeance and wrath and anger on the nations which have not obeyed. He says, listen, there is coming a great day for you, but it won't be because of your army. Your army will be broken. It won't be your tanks. Those will break. It will be because I will break the back of all the things that have been standing between you and me. Real victory doesn't occur when you're the most prosperous nation. It doesn't occur when you're the strongest nation with the biggest military. Real victory occurs when your nation is on its knees before me and has surrendered to me. That's victory. And anything short of that, anything short of that is not going to make you ultimately strong. I'm going to use the nations, verse 15, to purify you. That's what I'm going to do. And the Lord makes one final statement of his case. You see it? Hear now what the Lord is saying. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. This is the Lord pleading his final case against them. Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he will dispute. My people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. This is God speaking to his people, saying, hey, hey, you treat me this way. What did I do to you? Answer me. I want to hear it. I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I ransomed you out of the house of slavery. I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam, my people. Remember now what Balak, the king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And from Shittim to Gilgal, so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. Look at what I did for you. I walked you through the history. We, we have studied together chapter after chapter of God superintending of a people that would have, would have fouled up a two-car parade. They did not do this on their own. And he says, look at what I've done for you. I've given you everything. And you, you answer me back this way. This is what you do? With, with what shall I come to the Lord? and bow myself before the God on high. Do, do, do you hear a change in tone? Now the prophet speaks, and he says, looking at our history, what should I bring to the Lord? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in a thousand rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? That's a great line. You want to underline that one. Should I give him the fruit of the, my body for the sin of my soul? Put a box around verse 8. It's a profound, blessed, deep, 
rich statement. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk in resolute humility before your God. The voice of the Lord will call to the city, and it, it's sound wisdom for you to, to, to fear your name. Hear, O tribe, who has appointed its time? Is there yet a man in the wicked house along with treasures of wickedness and a short measure that is cursed? Can I justify wicked scales and a bag of deceptive weights? You greedy people who are running greedy things on the side, you economically imbalanced cheaters. For the rich men of the city are full of violence. Her residents speak lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. You're all a bunch of liars. You're cheating each other left and right. You're all a bunch of liars. So I will also make you sick, striking you down, desolating you because of your sins. Right next to verse 13, 1 Corinthians 11. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 11? Some of you are sick in the church because of the way you've behaved one another in the body of Christ. That God will actually bring sickness to his people as a way of chastising them. Therefore, I will give you up for destruction and your inhabitants for derision, and you will hear the reproach of my people. Woe is me, for I am like the fruit picker, like the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig which I crave. He says that we're going into a time that because you are not going to give up your sinfulness and your new morality, I'm going to strip you down to where you don't have hardly anything left. The godly person has perished from the land. There's no upright person among them. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a trap, with a net. He says what's going to happen is eventually the, the godly people will be silenced and snuffed out and pushed away because you have decided that you want to adopt evil and you will not allow them to be part of you. Concerning evil, both hands will learn to do it well. That's a great expression. <laughs> Concerning evil, you, you'll, be, you'll be ambidextrous with your evil. You can do it on both hands. Look at that. Da, 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 da. <laughs> the prince asks also the judge for a bribe. And a great man speaks the desire of his soul, so they weave it together. He says the rich people will buy their own justice. Everybody will be looking for bribes, and nobody will be honest. The day when you post your watchman, your punishment will come, then your confusion will occur. Now here's, I have three words written next to verse 5. Trust no one. Do not trust in a neighbor. Do not have confidence in a friend. For from her who lies in your bosom, guard your lips. Watch the person you're sleeping with. Keep one eye open at all times. For, for son treats father contemptuously, daughter rises up against her mother, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. I want you to put next to that Matthew 10. Jesus is going to refer back to this. He's going to say there's coming a day when the Jewish people will be in such tough situation that they will be their own enemy. They will turn on their own families. But as for me, he says... I will watch expectantly for the Lord. Would you look at verse 7 for a second? I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Put a box around verse 7. Stop and contemplate this. In the face of an ever-growing coldness in the nation, what was his response? To spend hours on Facebook enraged at what people are doing wrong? No. Here's what he did. I'm going to spend hours looking at you. You'll hear me. The right place to take your frustration over what's happening in the nation is God. And by the way, waiting, kala, is wrapping your strength around my weakness. It is a very tough thing to do. I'm going to bring my frustration and my anger to you, Lord, and I'm going to watch for you, and I'm going to allow you to take your strength and wrap it around my weakness, and I'm going to be exhausted after an hour of waiting before you. Verse 8, do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is light for me. He says, pull the curtain down. It doesn't matter. 
I've got God and you're not taking him. You can cut me down to anything. You can take away everything I have, but you cannot stop me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I've sinned against him, not because you have. I will not go into feeling I'm being stripped down because of other people. I will realize I deserve nothing. This guy's got such a great attitude. Psalm 51, verse 4, 1 Chronicles 21. These are, these are statements of this same idea. Until he pleads my case and executes justice for me, he will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. I, I want you to stop for a second. And I want you to see that, that by the time you get down to the very end of this, he has emptied his heart and he says, Then my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look on her, and at that time she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. There are going to be those who will stick their face, finger in my face and tell me my God doesn't exist. You know what this sounds like? It sounds like Second Peter. It sounds like, where is the sign of his coming? And, and, and Peter says, have you forgotten the flood? Wait a minute. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is patient toward all men, he says. It will be a day when they come to you from Assyria, the cities of Egypt, Egypt even to the Euphrates, from sea to sea, mountain to mountain, and the earth will become desolate because of her inhabitants on account of the fruit of their deeds. He says, he's talking about a time of future tribulation and destruction on the nations that is, is terrible. And then he ends with the last piece, the last part of Messiah, and I love this. Look at this. It's, it's a beautiful statement. Shepherd your people with your scepter. What does that mean? What's a scepter? Something a king. So you're my king, but you're my shepherd. Do you see it? Shepherd your people with your scepter. The flock of your possession, which dwells by itself in the woodland, in the midst of a fruitful field, let them feed in Bashan, that's in the Golan Heights, in Gilead, that's in Jordan today, as in the days of old, <coughs> as in the days when you came out from the land of Egypt, I will show you miracles. Do you remember that Joel says, your young men will dream dreams, and your and your young women will see visions. He says, he comes back and says, nation will see, nations will see and be ashamed of their plight. They will put their hand on their mouth. Their ears will be deaf. Look at verse 16. What does it sound like? There's coming a time in your future, Israel. There's coming a time when nations will be ashamed of their own might. They will put their hand on their mouth and on their ears will be deaf. But God's not done. Because this ends with a king with a scepter who's a shepherd who's gathering them. Who is like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us he will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob, unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our fathers from the days of old. It ends with, no matter what happens to us, in the end, there will be a shepherd king, and he will gather us, and we will be saved. We will be rescued.